In the second half of 2005, U.S. forces go on the offensive in both Al Qaim and Tel Afer. Troops kill or scare off dozens of foreign fighters. But unlike previous operations, the Americans don't fall back to their isolated base. Instead, they hold their ground, living with the newly trained Iraqi security forces in small bases throughout the city. Anytime somebody decided they wanted to make trouble in this area, fine, we're going to stick some soldiers in your backyard. The new tactic works. It prevents insurgents from returning to areas and terrorizing the population all over again. We were really able to keep a continuous pressure on the enemy or a continuous interaction with the population. And every day we could feel like, okay, we have, we have accomplished something. You know, little things are changing for the better. Howell feels a deep sense of satisfaction when he sees Iraqis smiling and living normal lives on the very ground he fought on only weeks before. After the battle was done, that was kind of a bittersweet moment for me where I was like, okay, we had Americans die right here, you know, for this reason. These operations are among the first sustained and effective counterinsurgency campaigns of the war. It's not going to be the U.S., it's not going to be the Marines or, or, or the Army that are going to defeat this insurgency. It's going to be the local population. The local population has to say, no more. We don't want you in our town. On the morning of February 22, 2006, a bomb destroys one of the most sacred shrines for all Shiite Muslims. The Golden Mosque in Samarra. The bombing inflames Shiite Sunni hatred throughout Iraq. Signs point to this being the work of the Sunni terrorist and leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Captain Neil Prakash can sense immediately that a new and awful chapter in the war has just begun. The term civil war kept getting dropped and, you know, insinuated, but the president really didn't want to admit. But when I see religious groups killing each other in the same country, it's, you know, it looks like civil war to me. By mid-2006, insurgent attacks spike against both Iraqis and Americans. I remember being puckered up, you know, clenched butt cheeks every time you're on the road. You kind of clench up, you kind of shirk away from the door, but still you drive on. In early June, Army Colonel Sean McFarland and his brigade of 5,500 troops received new orders. Eliminate Al-Qaeda's forces and their influence from Anbar's capital city of Ramadi. Education was grinding to a halt. Business was grinding to a halt. Civil rights, particularly for women, were over. And uh, Al-Qaeda was doing everything they could to move Ramadi back to the 14th century. The 46-year-old veteran of the Gulf War is ready to take on the troubled area. The young men he leads, including 24-year-old Texan Andrew Hightower, have their hands full from day one. When I first got to Ramadi, it was a, it was a wake-up call. A lot of people call it the wild, wild west. Um, when I got there. Uh, actually, on my first night there, an Iraqi army vehicle got ambushed uh, by RPGs and small arms fire. Seven killed in action. Hightower and his fellow soldiers aren't the first to try to stop the violence in Ramadi. Previous units had secured the city had left it vulnerable by returning to their forward operating base, or FOB. The battalion that we had replaced, um, unfortunately, had taken some heavy casualties, 
and they'd gone back into that, that FOB mentality that if we stay back in our FOB, we stay back in our, our outposts, that we're going to be safe. So McFarland tries a new tactic here. His soldiers leave the safety of their FOB and live among Iraqis exposed in the city. They saw that, and that was reassuring to them. They knew that we wouldn't just get in our Humvees and drive back onto our FOB, and they wouldn't see us again for another few days. In August, Al-Qaeda murders a respected Sunni community leader who dared to speak out against the terrorists. Resentment against Al-Qaeda reaches a breaking point, and a group of Sunni sheikhs requests a meeting with McFarland. He's unsure what to expect from these men, some of whom have exchanged fire with U.S. forces. There were uh, dozens of guys in their tribal sheikh robes lining the walls, all wanting to meet me. The tribal leaders call themselves the Awakening Council, and they give McFarland stunning news. They've had enough of Al-Qaeda. They're prepared to fight alongside the U.S. against the terrorists. And this was a sea change, because now, instead of the tribes trying to walk that middle line between the Americans and Al-Qaeda, they were clearly moving themselves into our camp. The alliance pays off. Together, in just four months, they free Ramadi from Al-Qaeda's grip. The awakening movement spreads nationwide. And in Baghdad, after a 28-month trial, Saddam Hussein is convicted of crimes against humanity and sentenced to death. In December, Staff Sergeant Adam Lingo draws the short straw and gets assigned to a security detail at a U.S. base in northwest Baghdad. It's early in the morning. Lingo is cold and tired. He's starting a helicopter landing zone, waiting for a drop-off. They called over the radio and told us that, uh, that the guy that they were dropping off was, was going to be Saddam himself, actually. And uh, that he was going to be turned over to the Iraqi government there and uh, for, for execution. Um, so, of course, we pulled out our cameras for, you know, it's, it's kind of a big deal. So, uh, we recorded it. A witness takes this cell phone footage of Saddam's execution. Outside, Sergeant Lingo keeps his camera recording as Iraqis carry Saddam's body away. A brutal dictator and war criminal is gone. But the war grinds on. So that was pretty irrelevant by, the, by this point. It wasn't really going to affect us. Four years into the Iraq war, Army Staff Sergeant Adam Lingo is trying to keep Sunni and Shiite Muslims from slaughtering each other. His unit is in Baghdad, patrolling Haifa Street. The road marking the city's bloody divide between the sects. There's a lot of, of shootouts that would, would happen there. Uh, back and forth, they'd shoot at each other from across the street, basically. It's civil war in real time. On this day, Lingo's squad searches for hidden stashes of weapons, going floor to floor through a building. Down on the street, an Iraqi army unit assisting the search takes heavy fire. Through the windows, Lingo's army comrades try to spot and kill attackers. They would see guys that would dart in and out of the alleyways carrying mortar rounds and, and RPGs and stuff like that, so they were engaging those targets. 
Lingo's video camera records the fight as he helps to spot the enemy below. Soldiers detain as many of the attackers as they can and turn them over to military intelligence for questioning. Lingo then finds the weapons cache he was looking for. All in all, a successful day on patrol. Another part of Lingo's job is to clear Baghdad streets of these slaughtered Iraqis. They are victims of the gruesome sectarian violence. You know, there were reports of Shia death squads going into Sunni neighborhoods and rounding up military-age males and executing them, uh, and vice versa. And we would find dead bodies all the time. Lingo gets orders to haul these bodies to a morgue. It's a grisly job. The facility is overrun with corpses. In the morgues, the, uh, the refrigeration is not all that great. Uh, and there's a lot of times where people never claim the bodies, so they just kind of pile up eventually. As the bodies pile up, and Iraqis despair at the endless violence, President Bush takes a big gamble, ordering 20,000 more U.S. troops to Iraq. It's a risky and controversial move known as the surge. In February, 32-year-old Captain Ian Brooks and his Marine Battalion arrive in Ramadi as part of the new troop deployment. The added manpower gives U.S. forces the strength to build on the gains they've made and reduce extended tours. The amount of people we had there was perfect because we had just enough to do patrols, everyone was getting enough rest, we were still engaging with the community on a daily basis. Over the next two years, the new strategy proves a winner. By the end of 2008, the rate of U.S. troops and Iraqis killed falls to its lowest in the entire six-year war. Al-Qaeda attacks are down. The Mahdi army is quiet. And Iraq's security forces are standing up and fighting for their country. On April 7, 2009, a new president visits the troops at Camp Victory in Baghdad. You have given Iraq the opportunity to stand on its own as a democratic country. That is an extraordinary achievement, and for that, you have the thanks of the American people. The lower violence allows President Barack Obama to make good on promises to reduce U.S. troop levels in Iraq. For some, the choice to go to war was the right and noble one. To have served after 9-11 was the best decision I ever made in my entire life. Um, I miss the service every day, and I have no regrets on joining. For some, pride in serving comes with a price. There are times when, you know, literally, you'll beat your chest and you'll, you'll be like, you know, I am all that is man. Fear the flag. You know, we're Americans. We're going to do what we can to protect our culture and our way of life. And then there are times when you're just bankrupt. You're just spiritually drained. And you realize, you know what? Maybe a part of me is dying. Maybe, maybe the humanity. Maybe you lose your soul in combat. Some Iraq vets struggle with pain and guilt. For the most part, what I've seen, I've seen enough. You know, I've seen more than probably the, the average guy out there, you know, from the experiences that we went through. It was horrible. You come home and you don't know what to come home to. This war is like kind of like the invisible war kind of thing. Like everyone here just kind of goes about their everyday life, um, fully being unaffected by what's going on over there. And then you start and weird out by that and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to look at the grab a 12-pack and go back to my room. I wish from day one we had been focusing on you know, counterinsurgency as opposed to killing bad guys. I keep telling myself, I should have known better. My army should have known better. You know, the white